study or the small group that meets Thursday nights. Um, they will not be meeting the next two Thursdays, for sure this week, but I think the next two Thursdays. So if you were planning on attending this Thursday night, God has released you. You may go out and serve the community via swimming parties or cleaning house or just napping on the couch, however you need to, self-care. All right, um, I think that's all I have. So uh, we would like to welcome up Pastor Dave for another amazing, soul-stimulating message. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, I got I to gotta go back. Listen to those words again that we just sang. I've seen you move. You've moved the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You know, I, I know some of you are around from the very beginning. Most of you probably weren't from the very beginning of Journey Church. And uh, our church had a chance to come down. I think I told you a few weeks ago, I had a chance to come down with the team and, and help out and be a part of the very beginning of it. And, and listen, God has done amazing things in the life of this church. And I know in the season of transition, there's sometimes uncertainty, there's a little anxiety, there's a little panic sometimes that sets in. You need to anchor to those words right there. God will do it again. What he's done in the past, he will do it again. He is faithful, he is true. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he, nothing surprises him, nothing catches him off guard, nothing knocks him back on his, on his heels, nothing panics him. He's not wringing his hands and saying, I wonder what's gonna happen. He's got it. So let's put our, our hope and our trust in him. But I wanna welcome you back to uh, week two of Home Run Life. If you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go, actually go back online and kind of get caught up. I'll, I'll try to catch you up just a little bit, but I want to, I want to answer the question today uh, as we talk about what does it mean to live a home run life. What I want to do is I want to answer the question, how do you even get on base? You know, if you're going to have a home run, you, you got to at least get on base. So, so how do you get on base for a home run life? So to go back where we left off last week, if you were here or if you weren't, let me catch you up with this idea that there is a pattern that God uses to grow us up. And we've been using uh, the baseball analogy to help us understand this just a little bit. So if you're familiar with the game of baseball, you don't have to know much about it, but you probably have seen that there are how many bases? Four bases. And, and you start off where? Home plate. Okay, this is, come on, it's not an IQ test. You can get this. So you start off at home plate, and then after home plate, then you go to first base. And home plate, by the way, is, is in the analogy about how gr God grows us up. This is the place that w reminds us that everything starts and it ends with God. It starts and it ends at, at home plate. It's all about him. If you've you got to first figure out who am I, where am I, where am I going, what am I all about, we tap into God's purpose, we tap into God's power, and we start to understand that very first thing. And when we do that, then he moves us. Now I can jump on. Now he moves us to where? First base, all right, so imagine with me the baseball diamond. He takes us to first base. And at first base, this is the place where, where we build our character. This is the place where he wants us to win within. And, and when we start to understand that, we're going to talk about that today. Then he moves us on to second base. And on second base, this is the community side where God wants us to win with other people. He, he wants us to have a successful life with other people. And, and it's all about relationships. It's about community. And then he grows us up further. He says, then I want to take you to, what's the next one? I lost track already. Third base. Okay, you with me? Stay with me. Third base. And on third base, this is where God says, I want you to win with, in success. I want you to be, win in, in productivity and win in terms of results. And, and, and it, this is all about us loving what we do and how God has wired us to, to do something. And then when we use that gift, now we don't score when we're at third base, do we? Where do you have to go? got to go home. It, it doesn't complete the picture to stop at third base. If you get stuck on third base, that, that's, that's no good for the team. Doesn't do, may do a little bit something for your own personal statistics, but it does nothing for the team. So you got to get back to home base. And that's when you use your gifts, you use your abilities to, to win in terms of significance. God wants to move us from success to significance, where now you're using all those things for his glory, for his purpose, for his God-ordained purposes. So in, in the New Testament, we're kind of using this analogy, this, this passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to give you a couple chapter, a couple verses to look at today. This is the first one, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul tells us this. I urge you 
in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, this is your reasonable act of worship. What we just did, we just sang some songs. That's a part of worship. But our lives are called to be a reflection of worship. And he said, this is your reasonable act of worship. No longer conform to the, what? Pattern of this world. That's the challenge. That's where I want to camp. That's what I want you to see. That what he's saying is, there is a pattern that God uses. We connect with him at home plate. He grows us up in our own, our, our own character. He connects us with other people in community. He, he wants us to be successful and, and use our, our gifts to get greater results. And when we use all of those things for his glory and his honor, then that becomes a, a life of significance. And th- that's how he grows us up. That's what God does. Home plate is all about loving God. First base is all about loving yourself. Second base is all about loving others. Third base is all about loving what you do. And when you do all those things for the glory of God, that's, that's a home run. Now, if that's how God grows us up, if that's his pattern, and we understand that, we say, okay, that, that makes sense to me, then what is the pattern of this world that we should not conform to? The, ba- the, 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 the world runs the bases backwards, don't they? They run the bases backwards. We live in a performance-driven society. It's all about results. What have you done for me lately? It's, what are you doing now? Are you making money? Are you, are you climbing the corporate ladder? Are you, are you known? Are, are you, you have an influence? Are people following you? Are you somebody? What, well, what is that all about? That, that's what our world clamors for. And so in the search for that, what ends up happening is we don't want to take the long way around to get there, so we want to take the shortcuts. So we think, well, it just makes sense. What, why don't I just jump over here right now? And in the midst of that, as we said last week, oftentimes we bypass our own integrity. We make shortcuts when it comes to relationships, all so that we can win in our results. The world runs the bases backwards. And they start off over here. And then maybe over time they'll say, well, maybe I'll build some relationships Maybe I'll connect with some people. And as you get a little bit older, you say, well, yeah, pe- people are important. And my family, I'm, I'm sorry I ran over my family on the quest for, for success, but now I want to make amends and I want to build that back again. And, and they're reaching back out and building, bri- rebuilding broken bridges oftentimes. And as you get a little bit older, you, you go back and you say, you know what? You start teaching your kids and your grandkids that, that really character really counts and Words really matter and, and our integrity really matters and we start living those lessons. Then you get a little bit older and you start seeing kind of life like, hey, you know, I probably don't have another 20, 30 years. And so you start thinking, well, what, what's going to happen after I'm gone? And, and you start thinking about the things that matter for eternity. That's the way the world runs the bases. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. So I want to talk about today, though, what is the, the, the conversation about how do you even get on base in, in the first place? Most players never even make it to first base. When you look statistically at, in Major League Baseball, three quarters of the time they never even make it to first base. They get struck out, they, they fly out, they ground out, they pop out, what, what, whatever happens, they never even get there. They get thrown out on the way. And in fact, that oftentimes is true in our lives as well. Most of us oftentimes get thrown out on our way to first base, and we stumble with this issue of our character, our, our, the issue of, of self-respect about, about who we really are. It's that idea of, of winning within. Those are some of the biggest battles that we face. That, that, that's the first thing so that, that God wants to develop. Once we commit to him, once we understand and we, we swear our allegiance and we yield to him and we kneel our hearts and our, and our lives to him, he says, the first thing that I want to do is I want to build into you. I'm not asking you to go do something or to give something. I I want you to grow up to who I created you to be. So he looks first at the heart. That's the very first base where God takes us. We we stumble in those areas. And so that's where I want to go today. Because the sooner that we get this stuff locked up and we understand the, the importance of that, the better. The better for all of us. So to teenagers, you teenagers, get this in your life. You need to understand the importance of this. 
You need to understand the, the value of, of taking this first step to first base and not bypassing that and just going after the money, just going after the results, just going after the, the, the recognition. That it's important that you develop you. If you're in your 20s it, it, and you're just kind of early on in your, your professional career, I'm telling you, this is a base that you need to start at. You, you need to camp out. You need to let God do something new in us. I, listen, I, I wish that I would have taken this to heart earlier on, even in, in my life. There are some things that are not worth bypassing the integrity, bypassing relationships on, on the search for for just gaining whatever it is that we think is, is so important. It seems shorter just to run to, to third base. But the question is, how do we get success without selling our souls? Uh, how, how do we get to that place without compromising who we are and what we're all about? And the long way around, though, that's, that's how baseball is played. That's how it's run. That's how God designed us to, to grow up. And so... Today, there are some things that you need to know, and there are some things that you need to do. So let me just talk about what is it that, that you need to know. Here's what you need to know. In order to get on base, in order to have a home run life, you need to know this first thing, this idea, that in the vine, there is power to win within. But when we drift from the vine, we drift toward vice. Let me say that again. In the vine is the power to win within. You say, how, how am I going to overcome the, the, those challenges that I face, those temptations that I face? The, the power is not within you. The power is, is within the vine. And when we drift from the vine, that's when we drift into trouble. That's what you need to know. Jesus said this in John chapter 15. I am the vine. He says, I'm the vine. And if you remain in me and I remain in you and we stay connected there, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you will drift. Apart from me, you will do nothing. And what he's teaching us and reminding us again is that there is a main vine through which life flows. That there is power in, in the main vine. And that, that power then goes into the branch. And that power allows the fruit to be born in the end. But you get disconnected from that, and you can imagine the results. Th this is how we were meant to live, to be connected to the vine. We were created to be connected to the creator. That's, that's home plate right here. And to be created with God, that, that, that God through God flows life, and through God throw, flows power. And if you would connect with God, then the power of God will flow through you. And, and you would produce fruit, just like that, that vine, that branch connected to the vine. What ends up happening is you end up winning and producing fruit. You'd have the power to become a person of character. You'd have be the power to, to win those, those first base battles. The, the power to win within, the key to this is in the vine. It's in the vine. It's in God. It's not in you trying to figure it out. It's not in you muscling up and saying, oh, I can overcome this. It's in being connected to the vine. If you're in God and you're connected to God, you get his power. It flows through you. That's how we change. That's, that's how we're transformed. That's what this is all about. You didn't just get up and get dressed and come here to, just to hear some great music and to have some coffee and donuts and stuff. We're, we're here because we believe that there is transformation at stake here. And the key to this transformation in our own lives is not in anything that you could come up with. It's, it's in God. It's staying connected to him. And if we live disconnected from God, then what ends up happening is we, we buy into the, the appetites. We become slaves to the appetites that we have, to our passions, to our, our fears, to, to sin. That's what happens. And we become enslaved to it. And you say, I, I want to stop it. I want to stop it. But you can't stop it. We can't stop it. I can't stop it on my own. Oh, you can, you can get a couple of them under wraps a little bit. You can kind of tamp them down just a little bit. But ultimately, ultimately you, you get owned by it. And it'll take you out on the way to first base. That's the danger. 
Nobody has the power to pull that off on, the own, on, on their own, all by themselves. So, and at the same time, let me add this. Those that are followers of Christ who come into a relationship with Christ and, and, and understand and experience the power and the work of Christ, we, we know that we've been forgiven of our sins and we trust him and, and we've been given the gift of eternal life. We, we are in Christ. But we've also noticed this, that oftentimes what happens is we begin to grow spiritually and you have some breakthroughs and, and sin starts to be stripped away from you and you start to overcome certain things. And, and, uh, and early on you think, this is awesome, this is transformation, this is what I was really hoping for, and this is exciting, God is growing me up. I mean, that, that's what happened to me. When I remember when I, when I first really gave over my life to Christ as a 17, 18 year old. And I said, okay, God, this time for sure, I, I'm giving it over to you. And there were things that I was caught up in, things that I was doing, paths that I was going down that were, I knew were wrong. I knew were gonna get me into trouble, but I didn't know the, how to stop it on my own. And that's when God said, I, I, let me give you the power. Dave, you can't do it on your own, but I can give you the power to do that. And he helped to strip those things away and be, birth a new thing in me. And I remember that feeling. I remember that excitement. God is doing something new in me. But if you're like me, maybe you've noticed this as well, that after a while you get a little bit lazy and you can kind of drift from the vine. You don't do it intentionally. No, none of us are thumbing our nose at God, you know, giving him the, the hey-ho sign, you know. None of us are doing that. You, you just you start to drift a little bit. And before long, you, you just kind of become disconnected. And you drift not toward God, you drift away from God. You, you drift toward that old self. You know, we have uphill dreams, but we have downhill habits. And, and anything worthwhile is, is uphill. You know that, right? You don't drift uphill. We drift downhill. When you come unplugged, and you're just coasting, and you're getting lazy, there's only one way that, that we go, downhill. And we start relying on our own power. So when God's power is at work within you, here, here's the danger, this is the thing you gotta watch out for. When God's power is at work within you, oftentimes we start thinking that it's us that's doing this. Oh, I did that, I overcame that. I, I pushed back on that sin all by myself. It's not, you're saying, it's not him, it's, it, it's me. But it's not, it's him. He's the one that enables you to do that. He's the one that enables real transformation to take place. So, so that's what you need to know. But let me tell you three things that you need to do, okay? Three things that you and I need to practice in order to stay connected and to win at first base and to get on base so that we have a hope and an opportunity for even a home run life. Three major league hits, so to speak, that you and I need to have to get on base. And you don't want to strike out on any one of these. You don't want to miss any one of them. You know, all three are important. So here's the first one. The first one is this, is you have to live for truth. Live for the truth. If there is a truth, and there is, there are also lies. And the question is, which one are you going to live for? Who are you going to buy into? Who are you going to believe? What voice are you going to listen to? Well, where are you going to nurture it? Where are you going to, where are you going to focus your attention? you got to figure out who's telling the truth. So, so who has the truth? Well, there was a guy by the name of Jesus who said, I am the truth. I tell you the truth. I am the truth. And God is our Father in heaven, loves you so much, he, he gives us the truth. And he goes, I, I want to coach you into the truth. I, I love you, and, and I'm for you, and I'm cheering for you, and I'm coaching you, and I, and, and I want you to know the truth, and I, and I want you to know that I'm not against you getting in the, onto first base and, and winning at first base. I, I'm, I'm for you, and I'm, I'm here to, to kind of help you. And I, he wants to coach us in that game of, of life. He wants us to win. Reminds me of a story I heard a pastor named Stan Toller tells a story about coaching his son in baseball. And he, here's what he said. He goes, my, my son Seth has always loved baseball from the time that he was 18 months old and he could first swing a bat to the time he could throw a ball. He said, we would watch the Cincinnati Reds play baseball on TV. Then we'd go outside and we'd play ball ourselves. Seth loved to watch Johnny Bench hit home runs. 
Now, by the time Seth reached four years old, I, he said, I became really concerned about his knowledge of the game. He said, Seth always hit a home run. <laughs> always. No matter what he actually hit, he hit a home run. No matter where the ball went, he hit a home run. He said, I could still see him running around our imaginary infield doing his Pete Rose slide, taking off his hat, exposing his blonde curly locks, and looking up at me declaring, home run, daddy, home run. Well, he says, one afternoon we were out in the front yard playing baseball, and I decided it was time to teach Seth that he didn't always win. He didn't always hit a home run. So first I launched into a significant lesson about what it means to make an out. I began to explain the purposes of of the bases. Just about the time I had confused him thoroughly, his mother came out the front door with four of Seth's reading books that now served as our bases. Together we placed the books at first and second and third and home plate. Everything was coming together for a great life lesson for my son. Then I explained to, to Seth, if you overrun a base and I tag you, you're out. Okay, daddy, he exclaimed, let's play ball. So I pitched a few balls. Seth runs the the bases to kind of warm up. And each time he went through the same ritual, head first slide into home plate, hat off, dusting himself off, saying, home run, daddy, home run, daddy. Now came the big moment. It had arrived. I reviewed the rules with a warning. Seth, my son, if you overrun a base, I will tag you out. Okay, daddy, play ball. I pitched. Seth swung mightily and hit the ball towards shortstop. I fielded the ball. He rounded first, his little legs churning. I I called out, I got the ball. Don't overrun second. He kept on going. I tagged him on the way to third. You're out. He kept running. He rounded third. He slid into home. He dusted himself off. He took off his hat. He sat down. He said, home run, daddy. Home run, daddy. I said, no, 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 no. You're out. He said, no, no. Home run, daddy. Home run, daddy. I said, no, you're out. I said, you're out. He said, no, home run. Disgusted, this little boy folded his chubby little arms, shook his head and looked at me, says, daddy, my books, my bat, my ball, if you're not going to play the game right, I'm going home. (laughs) We're all a little bit like Seth, aren't we? When God teaches us the truth about how the game of life works and there's something that we don't like about it and we say, I'm going to take my bat and my ball, I'm going home. Forget you. I don't need this. I'm not going to play that way. I want to play the way I want to play. Listen to what Paul wrote to young Timothy. He reminded him that all scripture is God-breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting, for training in righteousness. He's saying this this is how you live right. You, You listen to what the Bible teaches. There is a right way, there is a way to win the game of life. There is a home run that's available to you. God has given us the training in the Bible. He teaches us in the Bible how to score in life, how, how to win in life. But you know what happens? You know what happens? Now, don't look around the room, but you know this happens. We get ticked off at God. There's something that he says that we don't like, we don't agree with all the way. It's just not hip. It's not modern. It doesn't go with the, the, the norm of what everybody else is saying and believing. And so we just say, you know what, forget it. I'm, I'm out. I'm done. And we tell God we don't like it. I don't, I don't think that's relevant in 2022. Now, maybe it's because we prefer to live for things that that seem right to us at the time instead of living for the truth. That's really what's going on. We're picking up our bases and our bat and our ball and our glove, and we're going home. We're like, I don't need this. Yet we continue on just saying, oh, yeah, of course, I'm I'm a Christian. We carry that banner. We call ourselves Christian. We we say that we're getting a home run, that, oh, we're, we're really killing it, when really we were thrown out a long time ago. And God's saying, you're 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 out. We just continue living, ignoring, not addressing it, like we didn't even hear it. Live for the truth. Live for the truth. 
it's the first hit that we have to make. Now, here's the second thing we have to do. You've got to live for the truth, but you've got to plug into the vine. Number two, you've got to plug into the vine. If the church is good at anything, we are great, master's level, at overcomplicating things. <laughs> We overcomplicate God's teaching so much. And Jesus was taking this very profound, deep, spiritual idea and then translating it into something that, that everybody that was listening could, could understand. He was teaching us how to connect with God. And he was teaching this in John 15 that I was, was just talking about. He says, I am the vine, you are the branch. Remain in me and you'll bear much fruit. He's just saying it's as simple as that. And what God is doing is he's teaching this to a group of people who were predominantly agricultural in their background, in their understanding. So they're, they're thinking, okay, I, I get it. There's a grape. There's, the grape has a branch and there's a, there's a vine and that's how the grape happens. And oh yeah, I get that. I understand that. I think if Jesus was, was speaking to us today, in our language today, here in Addison in 2022, I, I think he would say, he would probably use the, a technological uh, illustration, don't you think? He would say, listen, I, I'm the power outlet. You're the, you're the plug, okay? You, you, you plug into me. You're, you're the cord. You, you plug into me, and you're going to get light. You're going to get power. You're going to get sound. I'm, I'm the power outlet. You're the cord. If you plug into me, you'll have power. That's what he's telling us. Have you ever had a, a battery on, on your car, the, the cable... You know, there's two cables. I don't know much about cars. Let me just, a little disclaimer here. When something goes wrong with my car, I just turn off the radio just a little bit. That's, a, that's how I fix it. I'm like, I, it's not making that sound anymore. I don't hear it. But I do know this. There's two cables, two pegs on the end of your, your battery of your car. And, and sometimes what can happen is they can still be on there, but, but they can kind of get loosened up and not really have a good connection. And when that happens, your car won't start. And, and sometimes it's just a simple fix is that. And and it's, it, all, it, all it takes is just a, a, a little bit for us to every once in a while remind ourselves, hey, it could be just a simple fix. I don't have to overcomplicate this. Why, why is my life such a mess? Why am I so off track? Maybe you just need to stop. You need to pop the hood and you say, oh, yeah, I just, I'm there, but I'm not really connected. How, how am I doing when it comes to just listening to what God has to tell me in the Bible? How, how am I doing in, in my conversations with God? Am I only talking to him on Sunday morning? When, when Kim is leading us through, through some singing? If you're not in the word and you're not in prayer and, and you're out of the habit of regularly gathering like this, which is what has happened to many people, myself included, over the, the last couple years, that, that idea of not gathering together, you're not really connected. You, you're there, but you're not really there. Does that make sense? The connection is there. It looks good. It looks like everything is right. But when you dive in just a little bit, you're like, no, 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 you're not really connected. You're not really tapped into that power. And you say, well, you mean that's all it could be? Yeah, that really can be all that it is. It's about learning God's principles. It's about learning them and, and obeying them. It's about depending on him, not, not just on Sunday morning, not just when you're in a Bible study. It's about depending on them every day, all, all the time, Commit, committing to be in his word and listening to him, Com, committing to regular prayer, committing to regular gathering and saying, it's that important. If you're just kind of orbiting in that orbit and you're not really connected, you're in danger of being thrown out to first base. So you've got to stay connected to the vine. Here's the third thing you've got to do is you've got to draw the line. You've got to draw the line. Living for the truth, getting plugged into the vine, allows God to speak to you and pour into you and reveal things in you that, that you're not where you need to be. That, that's what that does. And he's going to tell you, hey, there's some first base issues in your life. There's some things that, that have gotten a little sloppy. And you're listening to the world. You're listening to that lie. You, you've been paying attention to what, what, what is being said on TV and on, on social media. And, and you think it's not that big a deal right now, but it's going to be a big deal someday. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. It's going to keep building up, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. And it's going to hurt the people around you. And you're going to end up get, being thrown out. And I'm just saying God wants to help you to see it. And so he's drawn a line. And he said, this is how the game of life is played. And he wants you to win. And when God draws a line, he, he, 
You have to just agree with that. Just draw that line with them. Say, okay, this, this is the boundaries. This is, this is the base path. This is, this is where I'm supposed to go. Why? Because God wants you to win. He wants you to win. And he wants to free you up. He, he knows that if you can make it to first base, you're on your way. You're on your way to a home, home run. But you've got to get to first base. You can't skip the others. You can't shortcut it. By the way, God did all the heavy lifting on all this already. He's done all the hard stuff on this already to make this even possible. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 6. This is a great one. It's worth a moment for you to, to go look this up yourself this week. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. He says, for, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anybody who has died has been set free from sin. You know, what he's explaining is this spiritual explanation of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's exactly what the cross is all about. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He says, you don't have to be mastered by that anymore. You don't have to be a slave to that anymore. You don't have to be held down to that. You don't have to be chained to that anymore. Because I've conquered sin. I've conquered death. And through him, he's saying, you can conquer sin. And you can conquer death. Because we die to ourselves and we die to sin. And we die with him in that sense. And because of that, we also become alive in him. That's what verse 11 is saying. Verse 11 says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Now listen to this in verse 14. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but you're under grace. In verse 17, but thanks be to to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you used to have no way of escape, you used to have no other option, you have come to obey from your hearts the pattern of the teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. You're set free from sin. You don't have to be held captive to that anymore. You don't have to say, oh, that's just the way I am. That's just who I am. I can't get any better than that. This is the best that I can do. No, you've been set free, which means, God, which means that God has made it possible for you and I to live free with those chains falling off of us, free from the trap of sin that holds us down. God has drawn the line. And our, our experience, I think, oftentimes is that we, we shed sin and we begin to grow and we get, begin to get freed up. And then we discover that, you know, there's, there's maybe one or two or three other areas that just keep, keep having a grip on us. And there could be things that have the consistency and the capacity to take us out. Listen, I have more than my share of those things. More than my share of things of, that I've been set free from in a lot of ways and things that just keep getting a grip on me. Things like temper, selfishness, destructive habits. And what I found is that these things just keep, they, they get a, a greater and greater grip on me and by the grace of God and a deep application of Romans chapter 6 and more intensely staying in the vine, that, that's the only way that those, that grip gets loosened. That's the only way. And over time, what happens is his strength that, that pours out through the vine and the branch, that's how, that's how it's going to start to lose dominance. And, and, and when your battery cable is just not connected very much, you say, well, why, why am I struggling here? Well, that, that's the reason why I struggle. That's the reason why you struggle. But God wants to help us to win within and on first base, to not be the same person that we once were. Because of what you've done? No, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done, what God is doing through you. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not pretending to be perfect you know, to, to get over these things. If, you don't even have to know me. You don't have to know me to know that I'm not perfect. <laughs> Some of you already know me, and you, yeah, yeah, I can attest to that. You know I'm not perfect. You know, our, our church before, the church we were at before, the, 
we use the mantra, no perfect people allowed. I, I just like that for a church. No perfect people allowed. And the main reason that we talked about it that way is that so I could go to church with that, that group of people. I just hey, let's make sure. Let's just lay the groundwork here. No perfect people, right? Are we in agreement? Okay. Listen, I'm vulnerable. I've been tempted. But it's not my goal to sin. It's not what my desire is. It, I, I, I make errors in life, just like in baseball. You know, we, we see that to be true. We see professional baseball players who this is what they live and breathe and sleep and do all the time. And what happens? They still miss the ball. They still trip up. They still overrun the base. They still have mental errors. They still have mistakes that they make. I mean, I still drop the ball. I still make errors, and it's embarrassing, and it's frustrating, and it's aggravating. But I know that by the power and the grace of God, he's made it possible. He makes it possible to have a perfect heart and not to be slave to sin anymore. So I don't know what it is for you. I know for me in the past it has been things like temper and selfishness and destructive habits. But what would be your three things? What would be three things you say, man, these are things. I I know I've been freed. I I know that I'm a new person. I'm not questioning my Christianity. I'm just saying that I still have some things that got a grip on me. What would be your three? What would be the three things that consistently tend to tempt you, that, that take you out on your way to first base? In fact, let me make it a little bit easier. What would be the one? Just one. What would be one thing that if God could give you the power and you would stay connected to the vine, it it, it would be major in your life. It would change your life. What would be the one thing? Here's what I want to do as we close today. I want us to seek God together, okay? For maybe what all of us could use, maybe what you really need is fresh surrender. I'm just going to ask God to break that cycle of sin, okay? I don't know what it is for you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. We're not going to go around the room. (laughs) But here's what we are going to do today. On your seat or right in front of you, there should be a little slip of paper. Looks like this, a little baseball bat on it. You should have one for everybody. I want you to take this piece of paper. Just just grab it. It's got a little bat on it. And I, I want us to have a spiritually honest moment right now. So just put it in your hand. I want to use this as, as a tool today. And what we're going to do is I want us to come before God together. And, and each one of us just take a major swing. A major swing to draw the line where God draws the line. But we're going to connect to the vine and we're going to live for, live for the truth. And we're going to say, God, God, there is this one sin. That if I could break this cycle, it, it would change so much. It, it seems to own me. It's got a grip on me like no, no other. I don't even know if I have the courage to confess it. I've never told anybody else about it. But I believe you. I believe you for it. Maybe it's one of those issues you say, God, I I have come to you so many times. So many times over the same thing. And you're wondering, God, could you really break that grip today? Could you really free me from being enslaved? I don't know what yours is. I know what mine is. Scripture gives us a lot of illustrations. If you're struggling to come up with something, <laughs> could be temper, could be lust, could be sexual sin, could be fear, could be worry, could be gossip, could be slander, could be drunkenness, it could be lying, it could be cheating, it could be stealing, it could be adultery, it could be pornography, it could be laziness, it could be a critical spirit, it could be hate. It could be an unforgiving spirit. It could be bitterness. It could be pride. It could be anger. I don't know. What is the one that has dominion over your life? And you would just beg God to break it. That's what I want you to write on here. I want you to write it. I want you to see your eyes write it with your hand. Now, don't write your name on here. (laughs) 
write somebody else's name on there, okay? Don't copy your answers from somebody else. This is your time. This is your game that we're talking about. This is the line that God is drawing for you. But I want to ask you to reflect on it. We're going to share in a communion time in just a second here. And during that time, I know it's the custom is what you guys do. If you didn't grab communion on the way in, there's some on the back table, and we're going to give you time. Maybe we could just play a little music and something in the background. Geo, if you've got that ready. If Here's what I want to ask you to do is just to take the next, next couple of minutes and reflect on it and write it down, fold it up, and then if you go back to pick up communion, you, you, you just put it on the table right there, okay? If you've already got communion, maybe on, on your way out, you just drop it on that communion table. We're just going to, I want you to drop it there, I want you to leave it there, and I want you to say, I am putting this in your hands, God. This is, this is not, I'm not carrying this with me anymore, this is you, you're going to help me to break this cycle of sin. And you just surrender it to him. You just surrender it to him. This is yours, God. Let me, let me lead us in prayer. Let's take the next couple minutes and do this together, okay? So as you close your eyes and bow your heads, Father, we know this, this moment right now is very, very personal. This is a battle at a spiritual level. We are in a spiritual battle. That's what you taught us. The, the, the battle is not against flesh and blood. The, the battle is not against things that we can see. The battle is, there's a warfare going on. It's about things that happen in our hearts on a deeper level. So I'm just praying right now over this room and anybody listening, the, all who have surrendered, you know what is being surrendered to you right at this moment. You see what's being written down. You know what's on the list. You you see the courage in our hearts maybe to confess and to say, God, just, just take Take this away from me because I don't want it to take me out. And so we beg you, God, not that we need to beg you, but we beg you that you would break the, the cycle of sin that we're going through. For some, they may just need courage. They may just need a fresh run, just like a, another at-bat. Some are saying, God, I want to reconnect with you. I don't want to be casual anymore. I don't want to allow that battery cable of my life and my connection with you just to, to kind of be flippant and nonchalant. God, we are desperate for you. We, we can't keep living like this. It's breaking down our marriages. It's breaking our families, our kids. It's breaking us from the inside out. And we know that we can't get to the next level because we're stalled. It messes with our belief. It breaks down the very best part of who we are. So God, would you move among us? Would you move among us? Draw us to you. Maybe this is the starting line for, for a new beginning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you're ready, if you need to go up and get communion, we're just going to give you a couple minutes just to sit and reflect. And then I think we're going to close out.
Father, this day would be lost if, if we didn't write ourselves with you. This is not about just coming to have us a religious experience. This is about having a transformational encounter with you. Our prayer today is that you would uh, move and stir and our hearts continue as you have been doing. Keep calling us to you. Don't give up on us. Thank you for the fact that not only do you pick us up when we get thrown out, but you dust us off, you put us back in the batter's box. Today is a day for a new beginning. Would you just come and stir over this room, both now and this week, as we, uh, we want to live home run lives for you. Thank you for being in our midst even here today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. I don't know if anybody else is coming up to close out or not, but I guess it's me. So see you. It's good to have you guys.